Hello and welcome to Furious Driving and today I've donned my red braces, unpacked the Filofax because I'm in an 80s icon, a BMW E30 and not just any E30, this is a 325, not just any 325, this is the 325 Touring, the king of the 325s. This car is very much peak 80s and perhaps even not far from peak BMW. So, and this car is currently for sale at Fairview Autos, just outside Orpington in Kent. Link is in the description below if you're interested. Let's have a word from our sponsors. You go hit like and subscribe, and in a moment we'll be back with the review. The person who bought this car definitely had a Scion organiser as soon as they came out in the 90s. Furious Driving, proud to be supported by Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the Furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. And Lancaster Insurance cover the Furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. So the E30 came out in 1982. Development work had started way back in 1976. This iconic and frankly unmistakable design, this unmistakable silhouette, it was designed by BMW under Klaus Luth with the exterior by Boik Boyer. And the processes involved were very advanced for the time. They used CAD computer design. They did everything to make it as modern and future-proof as possible. And although it is very, very distinct in its own right, it is clearly an evolution of the previous car, the E21. And the car was massively successful. It was an enormous status symbol through the 1980s. If you were a trader working in Canary Wharf and getting a bonus, and the 911 was a bit much for everyday driving, you got yourself an E30 and a pair of braces to match. It had become very much a status symbol. BMW's build quality was exemplary, some of the best on the market. The styling was sharp and aggressive in the way that only the 80s really can get away with. But at the same time, it was delicate and pretty and refined in a way that BMW really have drifted away from. You look at some of the more recent models and it's like looking at a, an 80s film star who's really let themselves go. And it's kind of sad to look at really when you compare it to this and the E39 and that kind of stuff. So everybody wanted the E30 driving experience, that creamy six-cylinder engine. The M20 packs a punch. Wow. What a noise. What a great noise. Whoa. That creamy straight six engine. 0 to 60 time of the 325 was a very respectable 10 and a half seconds and top speed 131. And it really was something of a driver's car because it's got McPherson struts at the front, semi-trailing arms at the rear, anti-roll bars, and it's got disc brakes all round, apart from a couple of very early, very low spec versions. So everyone wanted one. They were building them hand over fist and selling everything they could make. However, despite the fact they had the two and the four door saloons, they had the convertible and even the Bauer convertible, which was still on sale, despite BMW's own version now being available, they'd never entered the estate car market, which is a bit of an oversight, frankly. An oversight which even their own people thought was a mistake, including one gentleman by the name of Max Riesbach. He was a prototype engineer at BMW, and he took it upon himself to make the car that BMW hadn't made happen. So he took a 323 four-door saloon home one weekend, and over the next six months or so, with the help of a friend and a shed, took the back end off. He removed the rear corner, the seat post, the top of the doors. He cut all of that stuff off and created the first ever three series sport wagon or touring or estate, whatever you want to call it. He made it a long roof. And there's a bit of a funny tradition of this in Germany because the new shape Beetle has also done as a bit of a skunk work project as well because they knew they would never get sign off on the Beetle. So a couple of young engineers, I think are quite well known these days, uh, took a Mark IV Golf, produced it, in their spare time and Max presented the completed E30 estate to management who instantly loved it and the thing was pushed into production very very rapidly indeed with virtually no changes at all. It was introduced along with a 1987 major facelift which brought in new tail lights, 
new bumpers, chrome detailing was removed in favour of a black. In fact, it was such a significant cosmetic upgrade, a lot of people call it the Phase 2 or Mark II car. Let's pull over and have a quick look around. At the front of the Touring, it's very much E30 business as usual, with the aggressive stance, the bonnet, which is shark-like in the way that it steps forward of the grill. The kidney grills themselves, quite discreet, but very affirmative and positive about what we are and where we're going. And of course, the magical twin round headlamps and joy of all joys. We have got wipers. We've got twin headlamp wipers on this thing, which is oh so very, very good indeed. This is peak 80s. Because this is a 325, we get all the good toys, which aren't on some of the lower models. And of course, we also have the fog lamps in the lower grille and the indicators here in the black strip on the bumper. So it's all very much E30 standard stuff. Moving back, we have got the fabulous lattice wheels. Again, top spec stuff looking great on here. Color-coded wing mirrors, the black sills making it look a bit more sporty. But then from this point backwards, things get a little bit different. First, we've got the C pillar and a D pillar, which the saloon obviously doesn't have. And the C pillar is radically different in shape because on the saloon, it comes up at a nice gentle saloon shape come to about here. On this one though, on this one though, we've gained a large square quarter light, squared off corner. And of course we come all the way back here, new rear quarter window, and of course the D post, which is very heavily sloped. So it's very much a lifestyle style thing rather than a big boxy Volvo, which is all out of capacity. This just gives you more space and more practicality than the saloon rather than all out mega literage. What is quite interesting though, is something they have adhered to is the design philosophy and tradition of the Hofmeister kink, something that has actually disappeared from some of the more recent models, unfortunately. BMW design very much losing its way in recent years. But the Hofmeister kink has moved from the C post to the D post into a little curve on the back of the window there. Around the back, we've also got a little spoiler, or because it's again 325, we've got a rear wash wipe, which is awesome. And we've got this huge, smooth, very 1980s flush tail lights which look oh so so very good indeed and of course black rubbing strip in the bumper and finally being a 325 we've got twin exit exhausts because it's got a purr with that aggressive growl which we love so much okay let's take a look around the interior of the e30 now climbing in we've got these lovely semi-flush cast metal door handles which feel really solid and very nice indeed looking at the door itself once you've opened it typical 1980s car not that thick of a door feels quite light um, interesting thing about the whole E30, it doesn't feel very, very chunky and solid like a Saab 900 does, but it does have a, a good premium feel, part of which comes from things like this complete door cover. There's no visible body colour paint apart from up here on the uh, door frame, which you still find on modern cars today, of course. But down here in the main body of the door, everything covered in this slightly soft touch vinyl material, the hard rubbery door handles and things interesting little design in here it looks like it's stitched material like stitched leather in fact it's not it's just a molded in stitch pattern in this vinyl panel interesting to look at but in fact just pretend we've got ourselves electric mirror switches here on the arm pull which is quite a convenient place to pretend you're a fighter pilot aiming your machine guns when you move your your mirror got plastic door handle surprisingly and a little door pocket not that wide but big enough stepping inside the car or looking inside the car i should say we have got the leather option on this car, which is a great thing because the fabric option, which was the standard thing, it looked like it was going to be a really hard wearing tweedy thing. But in fact, it wore through on the seat bases really, really easily. It was quite fragile. This though, the comfortable leather, it's a surprisingly wide and comfy seat rather than a sporty seat, considering this is the 325, although it's a 325 auto rather than a full on sporty model. Let's climb aboard and see what we can see. Okay. Right. Com important consumer information, first of all, we have a large flat area where you can put sandwiches, cups of tea, and other commodious luncheon items. To the left of that, we've got a big recessed area divided. Well, the divider, like the Titanic's watertight doors, does not go all the way across. So if you try and put soup in one, custard in another, they will intermingle. You have a very unfortunate lunch if you try and do that. Maybe dry sushi, or maybe go for a very 1980s cocktail party arrangement with lumps of cheese with pineapple on cocktail sticks in one and pigs in blankets in the next. Maybe some mayonnaise on the far side. Now, anyway, moving back to the business of driving the car, we have a very angular trapezoidal, no, not trapezoidal, rhomboid perhaps. I'll think of some rather geometric words in a second. Binnacle cover. We have got big, big dials here. The speedometer on the left, whizzing around to 150 miles an hour. Big white digits, very legible with white needles as well. The rev counter on the right-hand side, 
redlining at six and a half thousand rpm that is a lot of revs and then we have this absolutely amazing piece of bmw-ness which is the mpg ometer the swingometer of fuel use it starts off with the infinite block of well you're not using any fuel at all going up to zero mpg when you're absolutely thrashing the car normally you'll see it sitting somewhere in the middle there we go currently we're doing no miles of to the gallon because we're not moving. Oh, and actually improving MPG by revving, that's uh, curious. <laughs> I think it kind of works on a suction thing. But below that, even more 80s and more BMW-y, is this light up strip of LEDs here, which I mean, blocky LEDs are so 1980s as well. This gives you your countdown to your next service. Currently we've got three green segments of, of time before the car is serviced. Amber means, ooh, red means, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And surrounding that, we have got warning lights in a hidden strip on the left and the right at the bottom. Moving back, we've got two stalks, which are the typical 1980s BMW thing of the strangely canted bit of metal stick, which has got a big plastic blocky thing on the end. Lights, indicators on the left and wipers on the right. Moving back further from that towards us, we have got a big, 1980s steering wheel even though the car is very very heavily power assisted with the steering the steering wheel is still pretty large it's a typical 80s thing beautiful quality leather but a hard finish with uh, not much soft give behind it. it does look though absolutely fantastic this classic three spoke design with the horn in the center hit the bmw roundel for a pop that's a very very red braces and filofax pop just there and as we glance off to the right hand side, first of all, we'll see two things which continue through the interior. First of all, we have got our little square switches and buttons. These, I think, are for the fog lights front and rear. And one's got a dimple in, one's got a dimple out, so you can tell by touch which one you're looking at. Far better than the modern touchscreen nonsense we have to deal with. To the right of that, we've got a pull toggle for the headlights, side light, then headlight on. But these little square buttons with the rounded edges are something we'll find all the way across the dashboard for rear screen heater rear wash, rear wipe, hazard lights, all over the place. But the other thing we have back across here is this round drum-like air vent which follows the shape of this top edge of the dashboard where it comes round into the, the vertical face. It is actually just rounded, carries on past the instrument binnacle into the centre section and then around there again. So it's a nice bit of cohesive design following all the way through the middle of the car. And Speaking of this centre section here, you'll notice it is angled towards the driver. This is famously the BMW uh, ultimate driving machine. Driver-focused instruments, so it keeps everything that matters with keeping the car on the road pointing towards the driver. The Morris Marina did something very similar when they put the radio only pointing towards the passenger. But in the centre section here, we have got the buttons we mentioned previously. We've got a more modern radio, of course. Big 1980s analogue clock, but in a squared off circles it's not quite round because that's very it's an old hat underneath that we've got a very large area for a very basic climate control system single zone heat fans direction no air con but this is well 1980 something after all underneath that an absolutely vast area for chocolate bars you can put a lot of snickers in there which is ahead of a big ashtray weird little socket thing which i have latterly discovered through doing these reviews is actually for putting a lit cigarette in so you can stand it vertically without it setting fire to the interior. Other alternatives are to, to not smoke. Next to that we've got a 12 volt socket, handy for your phone charging. This car has got the automatic gearbox, I think it's a four speed from memory, I'll check that in a minute. Um, this though probably has saved this car because the manuals were loved by the drift boys and were absolutely ragged to death. So finding a 325 manual, very rare these days, finding a 325 auto a little bit easier. Next to that we have got our electric window switches. You'll see more of these concave and convex little square buttons either side of the gear shift. Then you find with these, if the electric windows on an A30 stop working for any reason, the chances are these are filled with gunk. So you just pop the switch out, load it with electrical contact cleaner and uh, leave it overnight and then butter bing, your electric windows magically start working again. Right, up above we have got absolute prime 1980s goodness onboard computer, systems check for brake lights, dip beam, engine oil, all these usual things are all there to give us a readout of what's happening with the car. This car does have additional square little buttons which gives us the electric sunroof. How posh is this in this car? This was a very expensive car in the 1980s. Quick glance back from behind the gear shift, we've got a manual handbrake and we've got a little cubby hole for more Twixes.
Well, let's have a look in the back of the car as well, see how that compares. Well, first of all, we've got more of the same pretend leather on the door, pretend stitching, this time manual windows, but the same plastic door pulls. But we do have more of the same very nice grey leather. It's interesting that German leather has got quite a hard uh, feel to it compared to Italian leather, which is like a very soft feel. Now climbing in, it's quite a high doorstep, a lip in stepping down into the car, like a Hudson Hornet or something. Uh, but because it's an estate, we have got a nicely squared off opening to get in. So we do have a bit more headroom, even though we have to step quite high over that door sill. Getting in though is a little tight because the gap between the front of the seat and the B post is actually quite tight. And once we're in here, even though there is like a recess in the seat back to make a bit more space for our knees, it's still pretty tight and my head is actually touching the ceiling. I think it's probably because this is a sunroof car and that does lower the headlining a little bit. So um, that's probably what has encroached upon us. Looking around though, it is a very nice and comfortable place to be. We can see a great view of the front of the car from here. That beautiful peak 1980s dashboard. Interestingly, although we do have three seatbelts back here, two of which are three point harnesses, there are not headrests in the back. We do have the amenity that the seats will roll forward, lift up, roll forward, and these will fold flat so we get quite a big load space if we need it. And now the thing that makes this car special, this is the boot, the bootal area. A little button down there to push, and up comes the tailgate. Interestingly, the boot release stays on the bottom of the car while the boot goes up away from it. It is quite a big opening, although it is hampered somewhat by the fact that the tail lights stay in the body of the car. And that means that trying to put things like a washing machine or a fridge in the back of here, trip to Ikea, might be a little awkward because obviously that does encroach quite heavily. But once you're in past that though, you have got a lot of space. A lot more space than in the saloon, certainly. I mean, it is very much a lifestyle wagon because it does still have quite a sharp angle on this rear tailgate. I mean, the thing does look absolutely fantastic for that. In the back here, we've got quite a lot of room. We've got stowage for our tools first aid kit on the left hand side we've got stowage for anything you want on the right hand side and underneath the carpet we've got a full spare wheel a lovely lovely lattice spare wheel all carpeted all good lash down points we've got a low space cover and if i can do this one-handed we've got load protection for your dogs as well if you want to pop them in the back too so pretty much everything we even have a handle to pull the thing down again with. So what you're looking at right here is the M26 cylinder BMW straight six. It's an absolutely fantastic motor, one of the all-time legendary special motors of, of all time. It's up there with the, the LS, the Rover V8, the Alpha Busso. What it is is just such a smooth, creamy, powerful motor. 168 horsepower in the late 80s was really something to, sh to write home about. It's also very easy to work on. Distributor here at the front. Timing belt, easy to change right on the front of the engine. Spark plugs down there. It's a fantastic piece of kit. But the best thing is the way it delivers the power so creamily and the awesome noise it makes when it's doing it. You had a choice of two gearboxes with this car. There was a five-speed manual or a four-speed automatic. And sadly, thanks to the drift community, who, when these cars were worth absolute buttons, loved these cars so much. And all the manuals seem to have just evaporated off the face of the earth. The auto is pretty smooth, but it's not really quite as much fun as the manual would be, but it does seem that autos are more popular these days for frankly unfathomable reasons. I mentioned in the look around that it has got a very big steering wheel. It is enormous. It's a great big leather bus wheel we've got here in front of us, which is curious because the power steering is, well, very powerful in fact. We have got quite a soft 80s style suspension, so the car does lean quite dramatically through corners, even though it's a fairly sporty model. And the number of turns lock to lock are, well, well, it is a little like piloting a ship albeit quite a rapid ship. That is an amazing noise. Even though the steering is very tight, it's very accurate, it's just a few too many turns to get around a very sharp corner. Um, that M20 engine just makes up for everything. You can forgive any mistakes, any ills at all when you've got that thing purring away in front of you. It's so, so good. 
Oh, this car is so nice. These seats are very comfortable as well. The sports sofas, I think you might call them. You may recall a little while ago, I did a review of an E36 over at Stone Cold Classics. And I did kind of quietly admit that although the E30 is the ultimate classic BMW 3 Series, I did kind of feel like the E36 was perhaps the better of the two cars. Now, whilst this is still, I guess, true in a way, there is something about the E30, that 80s character, that, I don't know, indefinable something that just makes it feel just a little bit more, I don't know, interesting and different. If I had to choose between an E30 and E36, I don't know if I could. The age-old solution of just, just buy both. Because E30 is just so nice and composed on the road. It just, this is just enormous fun to drive. That creamy straight six engine, I could just drive this all day. I don't want to give it back. If this had a manual gearbox on it, I would be part exiting one of my cars for it right now. I say this all the time. I'm very easily swayed by, by different cars, but I've had a three series before, an E30 320 auto, which foolishly I sold for way too little money before the market blew up on them. And I wanted an estate car, really. It was a 320 saloon. I wanted a 325 estate. I thought I could sell my 320 and walk straight into one. I was very wrong. But mine did make the same lovely noise. Oh, it's a growl, isn't it? It's a proper growl. Anyway, if you've enjoyed this video, please, as always, hit like and subscribe and join me again next time driving something completely different.